have one more stop before New York City, and today we're diving into war zones. Known as the greatest female war correspondent of the 20th century, Martha Gellhorn takes the podcast by storm, or at least leads us into several of them. Born November 1908 in St. Louis, Missouri, Gellhorn was the daughter of a suffragist mother and a Jewish gynecologist. Who, it's an auspicious beginning. Yes, who at one point was the only such professional in the city. Wow. So already she is being set up to make a difference. During World War I, her father faced some prejudice, as many German immigrants did. Meanwhile, her mother marched through the streets for women's right to vote. Now, how did her father feel about this? Do we have any record of it? I imagine he either was neutral or was like, yes, go march, go get the vote. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Because he he knew what she was about, and and he was with her on that. Yes, her parents were actually fairly progressive for the time. And thankfully, the prejudice didn't affect her family over much during World War I. The marching through the streets for women's right to vote did. Gellhorn herself remembers that the other girls at school had been told by their mothers to avoid the daughter of a radical. So she ate alone at lunch. Ouch. In 1920, she was attending a private girls' school, but her parents actually pushed for the creation of a new school because she came home with a biology book that didn't show the human body below the navel. Oh, that's a glaring omission. So she became one of the first pupils to the John Burroughs School, which was established upon the conviction that each child has latent possibilities of power, and that it is the chief purpose of the school to cooperate with parents in discovering, fostering, and developing that power. That sounds so beautiful. You really, and, and what year was this? 1920. Yeah, you really forget how progressive people were back then. I mean, clearly not everyone, but there was, there was a whole lot of change making going on then. When she was 17, her father took her and her younger brother on a tour of Germany, in, her, in a rented red Mercedes-Benz. However, the trip was not a success. She hated opera and didn't like the Germans. Oh, no! Must have been disappointing for her dad. I imagine so. Now, this was only one trip. The family traveled frequently, which fed Gellhorn's restlessness. Other trips included Spain and France until she went off to college, though she failed the entrance exams the first time around. Now, how did that happen? We know that she later goes on to be world famous for her writing. Is Were they just really tough entrance exams? Well, you see, she was applying to her mother's alma mater, Bryn Mawr College, and the previous president, M. Carey Thomas, had actually gone and made the entrance exams as difficult as those of Harvard's. Gotcha. So <laughs> we're, we're at the point where women's colleges are trying to assert that we are just as rigorous as men's colleges and, you know, we, we will not be delivering a subpar education, uh, kind of fighting back against the stereotype of women going to college to um, be well-educated enough to converse with their husbands. Either way, she passes them the second time around and joins the college in the fall of 1926. Ah, and how does that go for her? It was not a success. It wasn't that she didn't see a point to hard work. It was just that she grew bored rather quickly. I see. So there were other things that were interesting to her in taking up her time. Or just that the coursework wasn't enough to keep her occupied. Either way, her junior year opened with a trip to the infirmary with no discernible reason, though she wrote to her mother that she suddenly felt too rotten to continue with academic life. Happens to the best of us. In her case, she decided to leave. She wrote to newspapers around the country asking for a job. She got one, and she left at the end of her junior year in 1929. 
only in 1929. Just in time for that stock market crash. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just thinking of, like, the level of qualification that you need for a job today. Like, she would have had to have graduated college, like, solid couple years in an internship. Like, Yeah, chimes have really changed comparing today's job market and credentials demanded. Mm-hmm. Because you see, initially her reasoning was that a college degree would qualify her per- would qualify her precisely for the sort of job she didn't want. And so she managed to join the New Republic paper in New York for the summer, where her first article was published. If anyone is curious, it, it was a parody of Rudy Valley, America's heartthrob crooner at the time. By November, though, she was a cub reporter for the Albany Times Union, and she was only 21. So a huge difference between then and now. Yeah. Although we do also have to give kudos to her for, you know, putting out that writing and being someone that they could value that highly. After six months there, she went back to St. Louis to see her family as... According to a family friend, her parents were sick with worry. However, she was antsy to leave again quickly, so the end of the year saw her back in New York City. By spring, she was in Paris with two suitcases, a typewriter, and $75, which is about $1,252 today. Which is, you know, not nothing, but she's still taking quite the risk. Yes, and it's one no one could manage today, I think. Well, not if they aren't Martha Gellhorn. I don't think even Martha Gellhorn could manage to do all this today. Because you see, she was laughed out of the office of the New York Times when she went in for a job. Well, there you go. (laughs) She ended up working at a beauty salon for two weeks instead. Now, did she did she have qualifications for that? Because I'm pretty sure you need qualifications for that now, too. She had zero qualifications. But imagine, I mean, imagine years later gossiping to your friends that you'd gotten a subpar hairdo from the, the renowned Martha Gellhorn. I don't think she was a hairstylist much after those two weeks. Mm-hmm. There was also a great deal of excitement with finding a place to stay. For instance, the first place she tried turned out to be a brothel, and the second was filled with gay men. (laughs) Gotta be real specific when you're asking for a place where a single woman can hang out safely. How did she find these two places? They were cheap. Fair enough. Now, I do have a question about the, the, the place filled with gay men. Is there, was there a reason? Was there a convention on? Like, It was a place they hung out. Fair enough. Well, it sounds like it would be safe for a single woman to be in. Yes, I don't know how she didn't notice something was up with the first place, because she walked into the room, and there was a mirror above the bed, and all she thought was, huh, that's odd. Parisian interior decorating doesn't live up to the hype. <laughs> well, so, as we will discover later, there is the possibility that she might be asexual or on the ace spectrum, and that might have something to do with it. Maybe. Either way, she does manage to get another newspaper job, which she then lost after complaining to her boss about a South American tycoon connected to the company making a pass at her in a taxi. You go, girl. <laughs> Make that complaint. It led her to write, no money, jobs hard to get, what the hell. Yeah, dude. She did try her hand at writing novels as well during this time, but as everyone knows, writers don't usually make much money, so that didn't solve her problem. Yeah, that's an interesting choice for a, like, make a little money on the side type of gig. And then at some point, she meets Bertrand de Juvenel, the writer Colette's stepson and whose father was the editor of a newspaper. Haha, I'm seeing some possibilities. She has an affair with him, despite the fact that he was married. That's France. It's France, it's the artistic circles, morals are not quite the same, 
I mean, even Colette had an affair with her stepson. So maybe it's the stepson is the common denominator. <laughs> Either way, this affair did not stop her from going off to Switzerland to try writing novels. However, he followed her, and they went on hikes all over the mountains. During this time, she managed to arrange with an American paper to write on the League of Nations meeting in Geneva in the fall of 1930. Wow, that's a big gig. How did she manage that? Negotiation. <laughs> After that, it was back to her bumming about life. Well, the life of a freelancer. The real problem, though, was that she fell pregnant, and Bertrand's wife would not consent to a divorce. That's a sticky situation. Also, despite France having the highest abortion rate in Europe in the 1930s, and therefore it would be easy to get one in Paris, she took a ship back to the States after only 10 months abroad to get an abortion there. Do we have any sense why, or does, is that lost to the sands of time? I suspect it's because of the whole Bertrand thing. His wife doesn't want to divorce. His wife is most likely still in Paris. A whole bunch of that. I can tell you for certain, though, that she felt like a failure. So she got an abortion in Chicago after Christmas instead and endured her parents' disappointment. Sounds like a lousy Christmas. It was. During this period, she immersed herself in work with a novel, short stories, and articles. None of the stories appear to have been published. Then, in April 1931, she got a job at the Post-Dispatch and traveled around the States for $25 a story. That only lasted till the end of spring. And then she got word that Bertrand was coming to New York. Oh, no. <laughs> she met him at the dock. The affair continued with travel around the U.S., a failed stint in Hollywood, travel to France, another pregnancy that she got an abortion for, this time in France, and a job at Vogue. Now, I think we need to um, back up a bit because a lot of things happened in that one sentence. So, Hollywood? What? Was she trying to be an actress? What did she try out for? She actually got an audition for a part in a nightclub scene in which she was supposed to swing her long legs and say, look at me, I'm full of sex. <laughs> However, they turned her down, and the reason given was her firm, clear Bryn Mawr tones. <laughs> I'm picturing with Catherine Hepburn saying, look at me, I'm full of sex. Who knows? I would have loved that. <laughs> so, um... People who like this podcast, if they have not already heard of Be Kind Rewind, the YouTube channel, should look it up. It is um, about old Hollywood, particularly actresses, and there is some overlap in subject matter. Um, but yeah, the, one of the things that she talks about on that channel is that a lot of the great actresses of our time um, initially had really horrible careers because they were miscast um, and put into roles that completely um, went against their natural um, talents and abilities and um, all I'm going to say is that it could, we could see an alternate timeline where Gellhorn is cast correctly and is a famous actress so let's see, so what else in that in the one sentence that you just dropped on us here so she, so she has her other abortion is another of the things that happened in that like whirlwind of a time um, do we know if she was ever thinking of starting a family not at the time, so things she told Bertrand was, it was a bit wishy-washy. She was like, maybe later, most definitely not now. Mm, gotcha. I mean, certainly with the situation with his wife and all that. Anyway, it is now 1934. They take a trip to Germany with some other journalist. Their host came with ties to the Hitler Youth. Interesting, so... <laughs> How did they feel about this? Well, you see, things were very staged, including a play in their honor, though the anti-Semitism was veiled. Gellhorn herself found the entire trip repugnant. So, even if she had not, to, to all evidence before, been particularly attached to a Jewish identity, 
<laughs> this would be the time for it to uh, make her uncomfortable. Yes and no. As we'll see, Gilhorn isn't really ever very attached to her Jewish ancestry. Mm-hmm. But maybe she recognizes that there's something off about these Hitler youths. Something off a little bit, yes. Now, a bit of background for the next part. The French government was not doing well. Industrial production had declined 80%, and unemployment was over two me was over 2 million people in a population of approximately 40 million. So about 5% unemployment, plus the worst slums in Europe, all while the government kept switching. For instance, there were six changes in two years. Yeah, so they're not doing great. With all this in the background, Martha, Bertrand, and some friends decided to start a magazine in protest. They wanted to campaign for scholarships and vacations for students, continued friendship programs with Germany, and to question why liberal governments kept failing in this depression. As she recalled, they had decided to give the Hitler youth the benefit of the doubt, since they seemed only interested in sports and physical fitness. It should be noted that Gellhorn was very much a pacifist at the time. Right, and and there is always the hope that if we just treat them like, you know, a civilized group of people, then they will act that way. They will rise to the occasion. Meanwhile, her writing career was going well, but the same could not be said for her relationship. Mm -hmm. She worried that they were too different and that she was just a bed warmer. It didn't help that she had lacked desire and found sex painful a matter she'd consulted several doctors on. So this is the the hint that we have that she might be on the ace spectrum somewhat, that even though she clearly wants to be in a relationship with this guy, um, she is not finding particular pleasure in, in sex itself. Yes, and add to that that she felt she was being a coward towards him. Hmm. How so? It's the sort of dragging a relationship on even though it's not working, but it's like we've been together so long. Mm-hmm. Right, it's it's comfortable in an uncomfortable way. By July, though, she decided to leave him. And in October, she left for the U.S. The two would remain friends for the rest of his life, though he wrote that he could never figure out how to make her happy during their romantic relationship and wondered what would have happened if he'd succeeded in doing so. At the same time, she wrote a friend about having an eagerness to live. Wow. So, if we want any more evidence about them being on different wavelengths, then there we have it. I assume she also left the magazine idea behind, because her return to the U.S. saw her traveling around the country, reporting and writing a novel. At this time, she was recruited by the government, specifically the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, to investigate the state of the nation during the Great Depression, and at only 25, she was the youngest of the people hired. Wow, so she is getting recognition. So it sounds like she is doing kind of similar work to what she was aiming for with that magazine in France, that it's for a different government, but the same principle that she's trying to figure out what are the problems with society? um, How is the depression affecting people so that um, hopefully some relief can be given? One of her first major impressions came from finding syphilis everywhere she went from 12-year-olds with open sores and babies paralyzed to entire families infected and sleeping on one mattress with each generation creating a new moron, as people called them then. It was enough to induce her to write back about the need for birth control to break the cycle of sickness and overcrowding. Yeah, I hadn't realized that syphilis was such a big problem at the time. For the rest of the year, she would travel up and down the East Coast on this job. Then she went to Washington, stormed into the office of the man in charge, a guy named Hopkins, 
and proceeded to blow up at him about how ineffective the aid distribution was run and how she planned to expose it all. Oof! Yes! <laughs> you go, girl! He calmly said he'd send the reports to the First Lady and suggested she talk to her about it. Strangely enough, her mother, and then First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt, had become friends when Gellhorn's mother was attending Bryn Mawr College. Mm-hmm. So, networking. As a result, Gellhorn was invited to dinner at the White House, got outraged at the gold and white china, and the guests laughed when the slightly deaf First Lady told her husband to talk to her because she says all the unemployed have pellagra and syphilis. I mean, I I get why that would be somewhat embarrassing to be saying loudly in public, but also, like, a lot of these serious diseases can be embarrassing to think about and, and have. And good on her for being open about that. Because, yeah, when you when you have serious diseases, you know, you you have horrible symptoms, you have open sores. A lot of times the serious diseases start as STIs or STDs and then, you know, show symptoms and get worse. So I think everyone else was wrong in this case. Well, Gellhorn wasn't embarrassed. She angrily ranted instead. Good, good. That is one of the problems that you do hear about, um, you know, when, when addressing the needs of the, you know, underserved and poor people is that a lot of their needs can be embarrassing to talk about. Um, I mean, for instance, people with heroin addictions often have problems with incontinence um, if they're um, trying to recover from it. Things like that can be really embarrassing and personal. And, you know, you don't want to have to say, like, we need to buy a supply of adult diapers so that people can get off this addiction. But, you know, that's part of it. So <laughs> glad that she was willing to speak truth to power. She was eventually convinced not to quit her job, which is probably good for some Washington men, as she suggested they break one FERA office window with a brick and wait for someone to show up and actually talk to them about how their boss was committing about how their boss was committing fraud. <laughs> to, to be perfectly clear, Gellhorn did not actually incite a riot. Right, no, she she just calmly and collectively said, break this one window, and that's all. Yes, break one window, sit down on the curb, and wait for someone to show up and speak to you. <laughs> I love that. Like a doorbell, but worse. But wow, the nerve. I mean, that she had gone from having, you know, these really inconsistent freelancer jobs to, like, it sounds like she's finally being taken seriously in her field, and the first thing she does with it is seriously endanger her job prospects. The trick worked, but she was fired for it. Really? <laughs> I love how she she finally has this, like, security and, and this, you know, recognition uh, in her job, and um, the minute she gets that, she just does this. On a positive note, her novel, What Mad Pursuit, was published. It was about three college girls trying to find something to believe in, amid brushes with syphilis, adultery, and alcohol. The reviews were not altogether flattering. The funny part, though, was that one paper thought she'd married a Marquis de Juvenel. <laughs> Love that. Gellhorn herself never wrote about her juvenilia, which is understandable. I think one of the universal experiences of writers is being somewhat embarrassed by the first things we wrote and published, no matter the actual quality. Yeah, because it sounds, I mean, I haven't read it, but it sounds like it was a very impactful piece. If nothing else, it was probably a lot of her own feelings having experienced a lot of uh, what the characters experienced and done research on it and seen people experiencing syphilis. Maybe a lot of those reviewers were just scandalized by the contents. That may have been true. I can tell you it's not considered a bad book. Mm -hmm. It was during this time that she actually lived in the White House for a while as a guest while working on her next book, The Trouble I've Seen, 
which was about her experiences traveling the country in the Depression. So she's writing the hard-hitting stuff right now. And she finished the book by late 1935, in time for her father to read the manuscript. What did he think of it? He seemed to approve more than he did about her first book. Unfortunately, he started to feel pain in his stomach. Oh no, that's not... (laughs) That sounds like foreshadowing. Well, she was there for his operation in January 1936. However, after she left, his heart failed in his sleep and he died on the 25th. Though Gellhorn doesn't write about her own feelings on this, their relationship had been strained, partly due to the Bertrand relationship, partly due to his disapproval of her first novel, and she later remarked that she felt like she failed him. Hmm. Wow, harsh. Now, I mean, he was he had supported his, her mother's um, women's rights thing, and, and he himself was a gynecologist um, and seemed to be pretty left-wing and, and progressive generally. Was there a reason that he was disappointed? Like, did, did he feel like he was, like she was pushing things too far or like she was being too scandalous? Do we know? Probably a bit of both. Even a lot of the time, the most progressive of the previous generation will disapprove or be scandalized by what the younger generation does. Mm-hmm. And that September... Her second book released to acclaim. Mm-hmm. So she's not letting his disapproval stop her. She's not. Her journalism, though, is not going well. Time didn't offer her a job like she expected, and an article to a European paper was turned down. She ended up in Paris again with a new love affair, the journalist Alan Grover. However, it didn't last long. She soon felt very alone and wondered if her friends thought she was a lesbian. I mean, based on what we know of her friends, that would not be a mark against her. It would not, but she also was not a lesbian. In the midst of this confusion, she found herself back with her mother and brother in Florida for Christmas. I'm glad that they had each other, you know, after her father's death, that they could still spend some time together. Unfortunately, she met Hemingway at a bar in Key West. (laughs) Of all the sentences. Unfortunately, she met Hemingway. (laughs) Oh no, what happens next? (laughs) His talk of the Spanish Civil War convinces her to join in. Her friend at Collier's Magazine gave her a letter stating she was a special correspondent, but this wasn't actually a job. No, she's just a very special correspondent. She was 27, had only $50, and spoke no Spanish when she crossed the border at Andorra on foot. But she has never let being unqualified stop her before. (laughs) Now, some background. The Spanish Civil War, in many ways, was a proxy war between fascism and communism. Some call it a dress rehearsal for World War II. It began with a military coup against the Republican government. Republican forces received aid from the Soviet Union and Mexico, while the nationalists received help from fascist Italy and Nazi Germany. There were also several international brigades, units made up of foreigners who are there for various reasons, ranging from wanting an adventure to political reasons like those that drove Virginia Woolf's nephew to get involved. Right, so this wasn't just a war between the two quote-unquote sides. It was, there was a lot of other stuff that people were putting on it. By March 1937, Gellhorn was in Barcelona. The hotels were full of Americans and Englishmen, and uniforms of all colors flooded the streets. She stayed for two days before traveling to Madrid. And there, she stayed in the same hotel as Hemingway, who locked her in her room the first night during an air raid. Excuse me? Why? He was worried she might be mistaken for a prostitute. Mm -hmm. And he gets to make the decision about whether she can get out of her room. How does she feel about this? She was not amused. In fact, she was furious. However, two weeks later, 
they started an affair, despite the fact that she didn't love him and didn't find him attractive. Uh Uh-huh. Martha, what's wrong with you? I'm getting a very strong vibe of um, what is known as compulsory heterosexuality, where um, this is usually a a phenomenon in lesbians where they feel like they they trick themselves into thinking they have crushes on men and into having relationships with men because there's this assumption that a woman wants to and that if you have positive feelings toward a man, it must be romantic love. And... (laughs) That's that's the vibe I'm getting from her. Like, well, Hemingway is a good writer and, you know, is doing interesting things with his reporting. Therefore, I guess we should be in a relationship. Well, her explanation was she admired him, but only as she would admire a surgeon in an operating theater. Yeah. Now, she did actually send articles to Collier's magazine about her experiences visiting the hospitals and battlefields. How exactly that worked, if she technically didn't have a job, I'm not sure. Maybe someone thought it'd be a good idea to publish them anyway. I mean, as we said before, she's a special correspondent. I mean, if they're getting the scoops, and they're probably really well written, because by now she's had time to become a good writer, like... Either way, I can't imagine it happening today. She stayed only a few months before leaving with Hemingway, first to Paris and then to New York. Why? I mean, she she had this whole job set up. As we will see, there's a pattern with her war correspondent reporting of staying someplace for a few months, leaving, coming back, going to a new place, that sort of thing. On her return to the States, she gave interviews about the conflict and planned to write her next book on the events. However, she longed to go back to Spain. And so she did with Hemingway. It included a stop in Paris to party with the journalist Janet Flanner and the Murphys, friends of Janet, though the wife would become her lover. Does Gellerin know about this? Do we know if she feels any sort of way about this? Considering the fact this woman comes across as rather oblivious from where I'm standing, considering the did not realize the room she rented was really in a brothel, despite mirror over the bed, it could be either way. Mm -hmm. By September, though, they were back in a war zone. It did not look good. Two-thirds of Spain laid in nationalist hands. The fighting stalled in Aragon, where they headed and met the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, so named for the number of Americans in it. While Hemingway talked tactics with officers and his friends, Gellhorn interviewed the common soldiers. She said they were voices you'd hear at a baseball game, in the subway, on any campus. So she's getting more of the, like, the oral history side of it, or the the social... Um, understanding. She's not so much interested in the strategy of it, but rather in the everyday. The, the on the ground reporting of, of the way that the people are experiencing it. Though it wasn't always smooth. One officer worried that she'd cause a mutiny as the men hadn't seen a woman in weeks. We're, we're back to the Hemingway people will think she's a prostitute thing where women can't possibly associate men with men unless it's you know, something else going on. There were actually quite a few women amongst the war tourists, as they were called in Madrid, but I rather doubt many of them were on the battlefields of Spain. Still, they were nearby, I mean. Back in Madrid, she is now, in addition to Collier's, writing for The New Yorker and doing a broadcast about life in the city for those in the States to listen to. The broadcast necessitated a dash across a street to the only radio during peak evening shelling. So, I don't, I, I don't have evidence of this, but I recently watched The French Dispatch, the movie that came out either this year or last year. Um, would recommend, definitely, it, it's about, it's a fictionalized look at the New Yorker's history. Um, and uh, definitely... There are some 
scenes that are reminiscent of this. So please check that out if this sounds compelling to you. By January 1938, she was back on a lecture tour in the U.S., predicting it would soon enter the war. Now, that was not a universally held opinion. The mood of the U.S. was against her. As criticism followed, she decided to head back to the Spanish front, where she didn't have to think as much and deal with people. Right, she just, you know, keep your head down and do your job. The war was now winding down. It would end in 1939 with the nationalists controlling Spain until 1975. While Gellhorn wanted to stay writing about the refugee evacuation and ambulances, saying it was all like the very last days of Pompeii, she didn't stay in the end. She went to Paris with Hemingway. Now, as most are probably aware, Hemingway was married at the time, and the affair had become quite public. He had apparently proposed three weeks after her arrival in Spain, Wow, th that is soon. However, it would be several years since then before he divorced his second wife and married her. I just don't see how they can continue carrying on. Like, this sounds like the worst relationship. It's like, like he's married to someone else. Um, she's not into him. And he keeps on being sexist and, like, taking her away from her reporting jobs. And yet, after a 1939 miserable family vacation in Wyoming, he announced he wanted a divorce. Mm-hmm. Which maybe he should have, considering that he's been cheating on his wife for years. This is very true. However, on Gellhorn's end, before the marriage, she took off to report on the Russians attacking Finland, once again for Colliers. However, her optimism from the Spanish Civil War days was long gone. She felt only wary and resigned, she said. Understandably. I mean, look what she'd seen. Once again, she didn't stay long before heading to Cuba to join Hemingway. At one point in early 1940, she decided she didn't want to marry him. Mm -hmm. He wrote that he understood and his divorce still came through that fall. Despite all this, she married him in November 1940 at the age of 32. No! I mean, I guess we kind of knew that it had to happen. Like, usually when you hear her name, it's as Hemingway's third wife. But like, after hearing what led up to that, you're like, but why? Why did you do that to yourself? I do not have access to the mind of Martha Gellhorn. The honeymoon was in the Far East as she was asked to go report on the Japanese waging war in China. How romantic. Surprisingly, part of one city they stopped in still had electric lights running, despite being bombed all the time. Wow, living in luxury there. <laughs> the mood of the nation, she wrote, was low. Opium dens, dance halls, brothels, and markets... She found despondent people everywhere in cramped little rooms. It's to be expected, I'd think, when your nation was invaded in 1937, and it's now 1941. Yeah, no, sounds about right. Yeah, this is, I'm sure, a familiar pattern for her in, you know, the Civil War in Spain. I'm sure she saw similar things happening. To add to this cheery image... Cholera was also spreading. Love it! So that's a callback to, to the syphilis reporting, too. I imagine this is not what Hemingway had in mind for a honeymoon, but he apparently spent a great deal of time boxing people. <laughs> Typical. Gellhorn now returned to the States very confused. She wasn't sure how she felt about all the fighting. Sounds pretty clear to me. It's just is awful. But you mean because people are, like, fighting for particular causes and they need to keep fighting to support the cause? Well, as she told the First Lady, now her friend, the greatest crime the Nazis committed was filling the world with hate because the hate will stay like an infection in the blood even after the killing is over. She eventually settled into a tuber in Cuba. And then there was World War II. Love it. 
it was difficult to get her into it as a war correspondent, actually. How? I mean, she's been having all of these big jobs. Like, she is, like, if she was ever unqualified for any of these, she's definitely qualified for this now. The U.S. military was completely opposed to women covering the war. Oh, it's the sexism again. This was also complicated by the deterioration of her marriage. For instance, one night when Hemingway was drunk, he slapped her over an argument about how he was drunk and how she was going to be driving. She then deliberately and slowly drove the car into a tree, got out, and walked home. Wow. Ouch. I gotta say, when you said the deterioration of their marriage, I was like, what? what is there to deteriorate? But I guess we see. Sex was still more of an awkward obligation to her as well, and there was an abortion. Apparently, Hemingway wanted a daughter, but this certainly wasn't the time to have a kid. Yeah, no, they're in the middle of a war, and also this is Gellhorn, so she's always going to be in the middle of a war. Like, if she's going to have children, something's going to have to happen to change. It's impossible, actually, at this point to say if Martha had wanted one too, but it seems unlikely as one frequent argument was over having children. Mm Mm-hmm. At the same time, one of his sons from a previous marriage states that Gellhorn was his favorite other mother. Mm -hmm. So she was trying to be a good parent, but there are a lot of people who, you know, can can be good aunts and uncles and good babysitters and good step parents, but they're not interested in having their own children and taking on that responsibility. Either way, Hemingway was angry when she told him he she was heading off to Europe to report on the war the first time around. He didn't stop her, though. The second time after a brief return to the States in 1943, he also left for England to be a war correspondent. Good for him. However, when they met in London, he needled her, was offensive, and tried his damnedest to embarrass her in public and reduce her to tears. Hmm. Yeah, husband material. This included going to dinner with a Mary Welsh. Do we know anything about this Mary Welsh? She became his fourth wife. I see. I think we see the writing on the wall for this marriage. However, when it came to the job of being a war correspondent, she got the last laugh. She was right there on the beaches on D-Day, and he wasn't. Ooh, now how did Gellhorn get this, this position there? She snuck aboard a hospital ship and locked herself in a bathroom until they'd weighed anchor and cleared the harbor. And then (laughs) no one questioned And then no one questioned her presence. I mean, of course they didn't. If anyone can project, I'm supposed to be here. I bet she can. The ship was bound for the American sector at Omaha, and she went ashore with the ambulance teams in the evening and wrote from there. She didn't question prisoners, though, as the Geneva Convention prevented such interviews from journalists. Mm -hmm. Still, I'm sure she got a lot of, like, right there on the ground sort of stuff written down then. Yes, she then proceeded to travel all over the European theater, including a stop in Florence, Italy, where she tried to help Natalie Barney get back to Paris after both cities were liberated. Oh. Uh-huh. Now, do we know when she and Natalie Barney had first become acquainted? Probably back in her early journeys to Paris in the 1930s. So from old what, friends by this time. Old acquaintances, from what I understand, they ran in the same circles once she started her affair with Hemingway. You have to remember Hemingway, protege of Gertrude Stein, who ran the other salon in this world. Mm -hmm. So friends of friends. She also contemplated divorce from Hemingway and having a child as she was 37 and suddenly conscious of time running out to make that decision. Yeah, you do hear a lot of people get to that age and, and really seriously think about it. But I mean, that sounds like a tough choice when she still wants to do her very dangerous, very, you know, unstable job. And also... 
if she is going to have a child with Hemingway, really? They did divorce in 1945 and never saw each other again. Mm hmm. Fine by me. She then wrote out the rest of the war as a reporter and ended it with the liberation of Dachau concentration camp, though she was not the first reporter there. Marguerite Higgins was. Gellhorn had no desire to be first in this. Understandably, it's, by all accounts, pretty grim. She visited the cells where people were kept in total isolation. She saw the crematorium where the clothing had been found neatly stacked in piles by the naked bodies dumped like garbage to rot in the sun. She was with one of the doctors when what had been a man dragged himself into the room. He had been the only person to survive the last transport from Buchenwald when the soldiers had opened the doors to the boxcars and found him breathing under a pile of bodies. With Dachau, her hope in man, sheltered through multiple wars and the Great Depression, ended. Yeah, so you can imagine that she was um, affected by this. She no longer felt that truth, justice, and kindness would prevail. She wrote, I do not really hope now. Not really. I only feel one can never give up. Now, I mean, she'd seen horrible things in, you know, all of the poverty and disease and um, the, the awful things that people inflicted on each other in, in previous wars, but this was certainly uh, unique at the time. Though she left Dachau in revulsion, she visited several other camps, including Bergen-Belsen and Ravensbrück. So it's as in her reporting of other horrific things of, you know, syphilis and cholera and, and various other horrible things happening to people that, although it is not something that she would want to encounter, she feels that it's necessary for her to get the full information and then put that out into the world. That is a feature of her reporting, yes. She then spent VE Day in Paris, numb to the wild joy in the streets, until she found a French acquaintance and spent the rest of the day sobbing into his arms about Dachau. World War II was not to be her last war, despite it shaking up her beliefs so badly. So what can she possibly do next? You'll have to wait till the next episode, because this was only part one for Martha Gellhorn. All right. Fair enough. It seems like she experienced a whole lot in her life and in her work. So much so, we've had to break this episode in two. Thank you for listening. Subscribe and remember, if his first instinct is to lock you in your room during an air raid because he thinks you might be mistaken for a prostitute, don't marry him. He's just not husband material.